Chrono Trigger is rad. Chrono Trigger is an RPG developed and published by Then Square, a modest project helmed by quite possibly some of the most talented people in the games industry in, well, forever. The creator of Final Fantasy, the creator of Dragon Quest, the creator of Dragon Ball, this guy, he, he did a lot of stuff, and a relatively fresh-faced composer who tag-teamed with the series composer for the entire Final Fantasy series. So, you know, nobody special. But these graphics, though, I mean, seriously, just look at this character design. That's Dragon Ball as hell. And the sprite work, just, oh my god, oh! At its core, Chrono Trigger is a game about time travel. You travel through time. The first thing that happens in the game is that you accidentally paradox your friend out of existence. And pretty horribly, too. You know, for kids. But after you save her, you're quickly whisked into a plot about a cosmic horror. Lavos. A being that will emerge in the not-too-far future and destroy the planet. You know, for kids. Taking it upon themselves to erase this terrible fate, our heroes will be led all over history in search of this primordial evil to destroy it once and for all, lest the future refuse to change. You know, for kids. Although despite the seriousness of the wider plot, the game is surprisingly lighthearted, and the time travel can be a little bit... uh... weird. Look. All time travel plots are going to be a mess. Are there plot holes in this game? Yeah, like a thousand. But sometimes a good sense of adventure is more important than any logical consistency. So the best way to look at time travel in Chrono Trigger is just to not worry about it too much. Not that it's going to stop me. Man, you can f*** with time super hard in this game. Allow me to give you an example. There's these chests that you'll see all over the different timelines. If you go up to the chest, you can open it for some cool swag. But if you decide not to open them, then you can travel into the future and open the chest there to get a powered up version of that item. And then you can go back in time and open the chests again for the thing you would have gotten in the first place. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But it's cool. There's a side quest where you need to have someone stay behind to plant a forest. So you give them your robot buddy and zip into the future to when they're all finished. Then, you just turn them back on and go about your business. And if you go back in time, they'll still be there, planting away. Aww, that's adorable. The pacing in this game is beautiful. There isn't a single moment of wasted time. No individual dungeon or area will take long to traverse. If you know what you're doing, you can breeze through these areas. Even during the combat, the characters will just jump over and bop! Bam! Bam! What it creates is a system that doesn't waste your time. Areas are deliberately dense and compact. Fights move quick. In fact, you can change the attack speed and turn charging faster or slower as you prefer. Every enemy in the game has some sort of mechanic associated with it. Form changes, active weaknesses and immunities, attacks that can be disrupted if timed correctly, and attacks that trigger based on your positioning. You name it. Check out the first enemy in this game. They call me Gato. I have metal joints. Beat me up and earn 15 silver points. Gato is a training robot put in as a carnival attraction. He has exactly three moves. He can bop you on the head for minimal damage and sing terrible songs at you. But his most important move is a counter. If you attack him while Gato is standing physically close to one of your characters, he will automatically counter with a move that is noticeably stronger than his standard attack. But if you wait until he walks further away, his counter will fail. There isn't a single enemy that is just a blatant damage sponge. 
Every enemy has some sort of mechanic that makes you pay attention, but if you know what's coming, it allows you to beat them much more effectively. This is what I'm talking about here, people. It's a system that rewards your knowledge by making the game easier and more fun. And despite all of that, the fights aren't overly grueling. Generally speaking, you're more than capable of handling basic enemies without too much trouble. It's a deceptively deep system that makes you feel pretty powerful. Each party member has their strengths. Prono is a sword guy with offensive magic. Marl is your support mage. Luca has cost-effective fire and buffing spells. Robo hits like a truck and has healing and multi-hit spells. Frog has a good combination of attacking and healing physically and magically. Ayla's hot. <laughs> but most importantly, they're all capable of dishing out good damage, each of them gaining one of the four elements. Fire, water, lightning, and shadow. There's a definite identity to each of your party members, and it makes each of them useful in certain situations. With a handy push of a button, you can quickly swap them between fights. And in combination with the different enemies you'll be fighting, there's always moments for certain party members to shine. But f**k all of that. Let's get to the good stuff. Do you like team attacks? Cause guess what? There's team attacks in this game. Every individual character combination in your party has multiple unique combos. These are called double packs. Put Robo and Marl together, and you get a perfect full party heal. Put Luca with Ayla, and she'll set her on fire. Slap Chrono and Frog together, and you get the almighty X-Strike. Ah! God, that move's cool. But wait, there's more. Unlock enough moves for everyone, and you can unleash the mighty Triple Tech. That's right. Line up everyone's turn and watch as they fill the screen with assorted particle effects. You know what's cooler than X-Strike? Three-dimensional strike! Ah! Oh. So not only do you benefit from individual party members, but each party composition has entirely unique advantages, which makes switching party members not only convenient, but incredibly satisfying. Or you can stick with the same party the whole game. Let's stop for a second and talk about random encounters. Random encounters suck! I don't think there's anything worse than being forced to wander through an area and suddenly have the pacing shattered by the game. I'd like to say, though, that for all the crap that random encounters get, there are ways to use them effectively. These kinds of encounters can be used to add tension in areas that are otherwise secure, giving you time to make a hard decision of whether or not to risk the dangers of the encounters ahead. The important distinction between random encounters that are used effectively and ones that aren't are when the game makes sure to establish hard barriers between safety and danger. That way you can easily determine- Oh! Oh, god damn it! There's a lot of mediocre RPGs out there that fail to understand this balance. Particularly poor or lazy game design will just fill an entire four-hour dungeon with bullshit. Oh. But luckily, there is an alternative, which I'm going to call roaming encounters. By placing enemies on the overworld, it gives players the opportunity to visibly gauge what kind of dangers they're facing, and make the decision to avoid them, or pick ones they may have a better chance against. I personally really like this system, as it can be used to add extra mechanics like first strikes, or environmental advantages that can make combat a little bit more complex than, RAR! Kill everything you see! The system isn't flawless, of course, as people can accidentally underlevel themselves by intentionally avoiding too many encounters, which puts them in a situation that makes the game artificially harder. But it's still less annoying than- uh... Gauging difficulty in game design is tough, man. When you're designing a challenge, you can't always be sure whether any individual player is going to skip as many fights as possible, or intentionally grind so they don't have to be challenged at all. And that balance is hard to find without artificially limiting experience, which ultimately isn't going to be fun for some types of players. This is one of the reasons experience tends to be quadratic or exponential in RPGs. If you decide to put off leveling for a character, the increased gains in harder areas will slingshot those numbers to be closer to your existing parties and level them up faster. But Chrono Trigger finds a good middle ground with its fixed encounters. A number of encounters are fixed onto the geometry, so if you walk up to a certain area, it's going to trigger a fight every time. This gives the game designers a better idea of what level the player is going to be at that point in the game. 
Luckily, these fixed encounters are somewhat avoidable as well, with environmental triggers allowing the player to ignore them if they so choose. By taking a combination of tightly designed linear areas and combining them with roaming encounters and a healthy dose of fixed encounters that you can't avoid the first time through, you create a system where you are completely able to avoid a good chunk of fights if you don't want to, but also one where you will be able to gain just enough experience to be able to handle the tougher fights. This works out not only well for the player, as it gives you the satisfaction of stealthily slipping past enemies, but it also gives the game designers a minimum standard for experience to be able to better tune the difficulty in each area. This means that the game stays consistently challenging, even if you do the bare minimum, and limits the amount of unnecessary fights, essentially completely removing grinding from the game. Basically, if you fight at least 60% of the fights in this game, you'll be handily strong enough to deal with everything that you run into. Backtracking through areas kinda sucks. But the game is nice enough to depopulate certain zones, or at least remove some fixed encounters when you go back through them. Not that there's really any reason to backtrack. But that's the strength of the area design in this game. You'll never be forced to go through the same dungeon twice, and there will always be new areas unlocked as you continue through the story. All of the zones in Chrono Trigger are very deliberate. You go in, you see everything you need to, and then the game gives you a little pat on the head and says, Here, this is where you can go next. There's a surprisingly robust amount of attention paid to the user interface, and the quality of life with the menu. It's surprisingly ahead of its time. <laughs> you get it? It's because it's a game about time travel. On top of the aforementioned quick party swapping, there are more subtle features. If you walk up to an NPC and start talking to them, you can just walk away while the text is on the screen. Status effects are universal and pulled from a short list, all of which can be healed with a single item, the eponymous heal item, as well as a few party abilities. The UI can take up a fair bit of the screen, but will automatically shift the text so you can see what's happening. And if you prefer, there's a button to manually switch it whenever you want. This is Chrono. He is your protagonist. He is your silent protagonist. Any last words? Oh, you cheeky p He's Goku, but with a sword. No, not, not that one. No, the other one. And that's pretty much it. It's easy to look at a game and want an in-depth story with believable and well-illustrated characters. And don't get me wrong, there totally is a complex and interesting story here. But sometimes, this is all you need. Do you know what Chrono's personality is? He swings a sword, and he gives a little arm pump when he's excited. It's easy to understand, and lets you get engrossed in what's going on. For comparison, see Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is not a complex character. He wears a hat, cracks his whip, and punches dudes. The character exists to serve a purpose as a power fantasy. When the character isn't cracking his whip or punching dudes, the plot is usually about getting him to a place where he can crack his whip and punch dudes. And if you take that away from the character, he's not very interesting. Imagine a movie where Indiana Jones spends 2 hours and 27 minutes brushing dirt off rocks. Not very fun. But that's the value of simple characters. They're very easy to project onto. That's why they're cool. Now, it's not as though Chrono doesn't have any characterization at all. There's a lot of small moments that lend credence to his character, such as when he jumps in the time portal after Marl, or when he agrees to storm the Ocean Palace to rescue Shala, or when he jumps in front of Lavos' attack and f***ing dies. Oh, spoilers for this 25-year-old game. That's right. The main character, the character who's been a mandatory party leader for the entirety of your playthrough, arguably your strongest party member, dies. Like, really, really hard. Like, that motherfucker gets erased from existence. And there's suddenly a hole in your party that you just can't really fill with the realization that, yes, 
integral piece of your group is gone. You'll just have to go on without him. Well, kind of. Okay, I lied. You can get him back, but it involves a completely optional and somewhat obtuse side quest. But the game allows you to go on without him. There's even different endings devoted on whether or not you do. And that choice is something that makes this game truly special. Like, for God's sake, you can't even use triple text without Chrono. What kind of madness is this? And this is where the game really opens up. If you want to fight the final boss, go for it. They even give you several different ways to do it. But there's also a wealth of side content. It lets you decide whether you want to fight Labos as an overwhelmed adventurer chomping for revenge, or an overpowered monstrosity that can beat him with a single party member. Technically, you can fight Labos only a few hours into the game. It's something that the game goes out of its way to push on you. After all, you know exactly when Labos is going to destroy the planet, and you can time travel, so why wouldn't you be able to jump right to him at any point? It's probably one of the most unique features of this game. At any point in the game, you can just hop straight to the final boss. I mean, why not, right? Granted, you'll probably die horribly, but it is a choice. Of course, any Square RPG wouldn't be complete without New Game Plus, where you can carry over your hideously overpowered party to steamroll most of the early fights. This is where the game expects you to beat the game early, and in fact rewards you with numerous delicious alternate endings. As it turns out, skipping to the final boss in a time travel story means you kind of create a bunch of paradoxes in the process. Because, you know, instead of continuing the story like a good little boy, you decided to skip to the end of the R.L. Stein novel to look at the last page and read the ending, thus spoiling the surprise for your five-year-old self. <laughs> so you get these fun little endings. Like the one where you erase your friend from existence. Or the one you get for beating the game in five minutes. Or the one where you accidentally turn one of your party members into an ungodly inbred mutant abomination. Yes, that one is actually real. Some of these endings are obviously for fun, but others can give you different perspectives on characters' motivations, or even just show you what would have happened if you hadn't decided to interfere with the natural timeline. But I'm going to dial it back for a minute to talk about my favorite sequence in Chrono Trigger, the assault on Magus's castle. After a lengthy quest to repair the legendary Masamune, you are faced with a dangerous mission. Storm the fortress of the dark wizard Magus, and stop him from summoning Lavos to this world. After your buddy Frog opens the way by slicing a mountain in half, whew, you're greeted by the sight of the devilish manor. Inside is... nothing. The halls are completely silent. And all that stands in front of you are some strange, slightly off-putting NPCs, joined by disturbing facsimiles of your party's loved ones. After searching around and finding no leads, you head back to the entrance, only to be taunted by Magus' right-hand man, Ozzy. That's when it kicks in. A low, ominous tone, and the first sound you've heard so far. You search the grounds again, but this time, the charade has been dropped. The people around you are in fact slavering monsters out for your blood, several of them crying out in agony at being forcibly conscripted to fight each other, and you. The normal fight music is completely absent, allowing that ominous tone to play unerringly. You come face to face with Ozzy's generals, striking them down before delving further inside. The music shifts once again, to the combat theme, playing even outside the fights themselves. You make your way up a long ascent, past Ozzy's weirdly well-constructed and numerous medieval traps, before taking him out too in comedic fashion. That's where it happens.
then you smack his stupid face in. It's a lovely sequence with great buildup, consistent atmosphere and action, all tied up with a climactic and fairly challenging boss fight. This is the mark of greatness here, folks. Hey, I've got a question for you. Are you tired of games where you pick up a piece of loot and it's, wow, 2% increase to my sprinting stamina. Amazing. Well, f that. How about 50% HP increase? How about total status immunity for every individual armor slot? How about 75% MP cost reduction? How about 80% chance to counter attacks instantly? How about an armor you can slap on your slow as balls mage that doubles her speed? How about a weapon that raises your crit chance to 70%? They do not mess around with these items, because guess what? This is a video game. And video games are supposed to be fun. fun. Crazy concept, I know. So instead of leading you along for 90% of the game, they sprinkle this stuff pretty much the entire length of the game itself. Hell, if you really want to grind it out, you can get a sword for Chrono in the tutorial area that quadruples his offense. That's just sick. And really, there's a lot of small details you may not even notice going through the game the first time. There's a sequence later in the game where your equipment gets taken from you. And if you get caught, you lose instantly, so you have to sneak around. But if you have Ayla in your party, a fighter who doesn't use weapons, you can fight even if you don't have her equipment. Frog's Masamune can pierce through Magus' defense in his boss fight without triggering a magical counter. Appropriate, considering it is a direct counter to his abilities. Not really a secret, but still cool. When you're on trial in the court scene, the game will remember all the way back to the beginning of the game to remember if you ate that guy's lunch in the fairground to heal yourself. And then they'll make you feel bad for it. Honestly, that whole trial is just loaded with this kind of stuff. I don't even care if you get executed for it, I eat that dude's lunch every time. Gato's song attack only does one damage, no matter what your level is. Which makes sense, considering he's a glorified training dummy. Oh, and also because he's singing a song at you. And there's a lot more time for you to find. Hell, you can go through the final dungeon, beat it, then go back to an earlier age and beat it again. Like, holy crap, who thinks of this stuff? Wait, 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 hang on a second. Go back. Yeah, yeah, just go back a little bit. What the... Is that Gato? You f***ing traitor. Average playtime will clock in somewhere between 18 to 25 hours, depending on thoroughness, and whether or not you want to do New Game Plus for more endings. Pretty solid for an RPG, although if you think this is too short compared to other games in the genre, consider that every moment in this game is jam-packed, perfectly crafted, and never slows down. Real bang for your buck here. Also, it's been out forever, so you'd be hard-pressed to pay more than 15 bucks for it. You can find Chrono Trigger on... Everything. No, like, actually everything. I personally prefer the one on the DS. It puts some of the cumbersome menu elements on the lower screen, which cleans up the game a bit. It also adds in some newer content, like the pre-rendered cutscenes from the PlayStation version, which are not strictly necessary, but are a nice bonus. It also adds in some new optional dungeons that aren't, like, great. But hey, no matter what version you pick up, they're all still fantastic because this game is fantastic. And the combination of a perfect lighthearted adventure with beautiful sprite work, simple but compelling characters, evenly tuned, fast-paced combat, and a time travel plot that doesn't suck complete <laughs> all tied together with a soundtrack that is as powerful as it is memorable, and you've got the recipe for a 100% bona fide classic of RPGs. There are many games in this genre, but none of them will be quite as timeless as Chrono Trigger.